Section 1. You will hear a woman phoning the local council about an abandoned vehicle. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6 on page 128. you will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Environmental Health Department, Paul speaking. Oh, hello. Um, I wanted to report a vehicle that's been left parked near where I live. I think it's been abandoned. I wondered if the council could arrange to get it towed away. Have I got through to the right department? Yes, you have. If I could just take a few details. Your name, please. Mrs. Shefford. Thank you. The caller's name is Mrs. Shefford. So, Mrs. Shefford has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Environmental Health Department, Paul speaking. Oh, hello. Um, I wanted to report a vehicle that's been left parked near where I live. I think it's been abandoned. I wondered if the council could arrange to get it towed away. Have I got through to the right department? Yes, you have. If I could just take a few details. Your name, please. Mrs. Shefford. Thank you. It's not my vehicle, though. I just thought someone ought to report it. No, that's fine. What I need to do is take some details first. Then we can decide what to do about the problem. Oh, I see. So the next thing I need to know is your address. Right, it's 41 Lower Green Street. Yes. Barrowdale. And the postcode's WH45JP. Fine. And if I could just ask for a telephone number? It's 01778 552387. I'm out quite a lot, but you can just leave a message on the answer phone if you need to. Or I could give you my mobile number. That's all right, don't worry. Now, could you tell me a little more about this vehicle? You say it's been abandoned. Well, it certainly looks like it. Can you give me an idea of where it is? Yes, it's near the main road that goes through Barrowdale. Is that the A69? Yes, that's right. Now, there's the primary school just towards the end of the village, and then next to that, next to the children's playground, there's a field... And it's in there. Oh. I wonder how it got in there. Well, there's a gate to allow farm machinery in and out. I, I thought something ought to be done about it. The children from the school might start playing in the vehicle and lock themselves in or something. Yes. You are quite right to report it. And what type of vehicle are we talking about here? It's a van, actually. You know, the sort with just a couple of little windows at the back. Right. You don't happen to know the make and model, do you? Oh, yes. I went and had a look and got all the details. I thought you might need them. I'm surprised the school hasn't contacted you about it. Anyway, I wrote the details down. Uh, right. It's a Katala, and the model's a Flyer 2000. Is that F-L-Y-E-R? That's right. Very good. And the colour? Well, it's not all that easy to see because it's absolutely filthy. And actually, it looks as if it's had a paint job at some stage. It's blue, but you can just see white underneath where it's been scratched. Right. Well, I'll just make a note of the present colour. And if you could just tell me the vehicle number. Did you make a note of that? Oh, yes. It's S322GEC. 
Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10 on page 128. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And it sounds as if the general condition of the vehicle isn't too good, from what you say. No, it's pretty poor. It wouldn't be drivable. It's got a flat tyre and there's a crack in the windscreen. I reckon someone just wanted to get rid of it. That's usually the way. It's been there for nearly a week. No, it must be eight days. I remember it was a Sunday morning when I noticed it. It wasn't there the day before. I walk past it most days on the way to the shops. I'd have thought the school would have reported it. Does the field actually belong to the school? No, it's part of Hill Farm Estate. Right. I'll just make a note of that. And I don't suppose you have any information about who might own the vehicle? No, I've no idea. So what will you do now? Well, we'll come and have a look and see if we can trace the owner. And if we can't, the vehicle will be removed as rapidly as the law permits. It could be anything up to 20 days. One thing I should say, I'm quite sure this doesn't belong to anyone round here. I'd definitely recognise it if it was from someone who lived here. So you don't think it was anyone local? Right. I'd say at a guess we're looking at a stolen vehicle here. I did wonder if it might have been. You hear such a lot about car thieves nowadays. Well, we certainly will be looking into that possibility. Anyway, thank you for contacting us, Mrs Shefford, and we'll keep you informed of what happens. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 129. Section 2. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a historic town on the east coast of the USA. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17 on page 129. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Right. So here we are in Fairhaven, and we have a couple of hours to spend in this historic center before we carry on to our motel. And as you'll know from the itinerary of our trip, we're visiting Fairhaven because of its historical links with a man called Manjiro Nakahama. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of his life, and then you can explore the town at your leisure. Well, Manjiro Nakahama, as he was then known, was born in 1827 in a village by the sea in what is now Tashishimazu in Japan. And like many people in that town, he became a fisherman when he was just a youngster. One day in 1841, when he was just 14 years old, he and some others were fishing far off the coast of Japan when they were caught in a storm and shipwrecked on a small deserted island. 
they had to wait for six months before they were rescued by an American whale ship that had stopped at the island by chance. Four of the five Japanese were put ashore in Hawaii, but Manjiro had become friends with a captain, William Whitfield, who came from the town of Fairhaven, where we are now, and he chose to remain aboard and to return with the boat to the USA. So Manjiro unwittingly became the first Japanese ever to set foot on American soil. He came back right here to Fairhaven with Whitfield and stayed with the Whitfield family, who paid for his education here in the town. He studied mathematics and geography, as well as shipbuilding and navigation. But he missed his mother and his own country, and eventually he went back to Japan, where he had a responsible position as a university teacher and also served an invaluable role as interpreter during the initiation of relations between Japan and the United States in the middle of the 19th century. But the most interesting thing is that the links between Toshishimizu and Fairhaven have remained and grown stronger over the years, in spite of the distance between them. And in fact, the two places now have the official status of sister cities. Both places are ports, so in fact the inhabitants have a lot in common. There have been a number of visits by the inhabitants of Toshishimizu, in particular at the time of the festival, which is held every two years here in Fairhaven to celebrate the life and achievements of John Manjiro. It takes place in the fall, and there's an ever-growing program including drumming, singing, martial arts, and stalls selling Japanese and American food. So if you're going to be in the region around then, it's really worth a visit. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20 on page 129. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now many of the buildings that Manjiro Nakahama knew in Fairhaven are still standing today. And so if you'd just like to hand round some copies of this map, I'll suggest the best route to follow to see them. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the map, you can see the Millicent Library. And that's where we are now. Now, to follow the John Manjiro Trail, you go out of here along Center Street and then head up Main Street until you get to Pilgrim Avenue. Go down there and turn right at the end. Go straight on, and just on the corner with Oxford Street, you'll see a two-story house. This is the Whitfield family house, and this is where Manjiro first stayed when he came to Fairhaven. It's still a private residence, so please respect the owner's privacy. Okay, now if you carry on along Oxford Street, then turn left at the end, you'll come to North Street, and about halfway down there is what's known as Old Oxford School. This was the very same school that Manjiro attended when he lived here. It was considered to be the best school in town because of the quality of the building. Unusually, it was built of stone, and the quality of the teaching. Nowadays, it's usually closed, except on special occasions. Go on to the end of North Street and turn the corner onto Adams Street. If you follow the road down back towards the library, you go round a couple of sharp bends, and on the second of these, you can see the School of Navigation, which Manjiro also attended. And if you follow the road on, you'll soon find yourself back here at the library. And I'd suggest you spend some time looking around that, too, if you have any time left. Right. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3 on page 130. Section 3. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 130. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures, so I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV, mm -hmm. and actually it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now, they're a big store, and one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas, so that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory. Or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on pages 130 and 131. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study. Mm. And there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills programme, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. 
I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called Time Based Media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now,、uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project,、mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well,、uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such, some are more experimental. So that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four, on page one hundred and thirty-one. Section four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the importance of laughter. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty, on page one hundred and thirty-one. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, everybody. And in our second talk on social psychology, I want to look at the role of laughter in our lives. Something that usually gets everyone smiling from the start. So, first of all, I'll start by looking at the actual nature of laughter. Well, when someone laughs, you've got movement of the muscles of the face and the chest. And you've got sound formed when the air is forced out of the body as part of this process. So we're talking about a physical activity, but obviously other things are involved as well. And this is where it gets more complicated. Laughing isn't something that you normally decide to do, so it's not voluntary behaviour like ordinary speech. Instead, it's regulated by our instincts, rather like the singing of a bird or the roaring of a lion. And once you start to laugh, it can be quite hard to stop. <laughs> That's not always under your conscious control either. But why do we laugh? Because we find something funny, most of us would say. But in fact, it appears that laughter has little to do with jokes or funny stories. Only about ten percent of laughter is caused by things like that. 
One suggestion is that human laughter may have originally started out as a shared response to signal relief at the passing of danger. And it's true that even these days, laughter's rarely an activity carried out by an individual on his or her own. In fact, people are 30 times more likely to laugh when they're with other people than when they're completely alone. Laughter still seems to be a kind of social signal. It occurs when people are in a group and they're comfortable with one another. And it seems likely that laughter can result in the creation of bonds between the people in the group. And it's precisely because of this social aspect of laughter that people like public speakers and politicians often try to get their audience to laugh. It encourages their listeners to trust them and to connect with them. But this kind of thing, controlling the laughter of a group that is, indicates that there's a link between laughter and power. And this is supported by several studies that indicate that bosses use humour more than their employees. And research has also shown that female listeners are likely to laugh much more if the speaker is male. So it appears that there are gender issues associated with how much we laugh. I should also point out that laughter can be used as a negative signal as well as a positive one. I think we've all probably seen evidence of a group using laughter to exclude someone, to emphasise that they are not accepted. So it's not always a positive type of behaviour either. So what all this goes to show is that laughter is a very, very complex issue. It does appear, however, that laughter has definite benefits. If we look first at the psychological aspects, we know that people often tend to store negative emotions such as anger, sadness and fear rather than expressing them. And it seems that laughter provides a harmless way for the release of these emotions. But there are also clear physical effects that have been monitored too. For example, laughter is good aerobic exercise. It speeds up heart rate and respiration and raises blood pressure. One researcher suggests that 100 laughs a day is the equivalent of 10 minutes jogging. Laughter also helps prevent the stress that so many people suffer from today, which results from the faster pace of life and all that goes with it. It does this by reducing the levels of hormones in the blood which are caused by stress. And in addition, it is known to increase the levels of chemicals that protect the body from infection or pain and so it helps to boost the immune system. One interesting study showed that people who had had surgical operations asked for fewer painkillers if they'd been viewing comic films. In fact, research has even shown that the quality of dreams can be positively affected by laughter. A good laugh ten minutes before going to sleep can prevent you from having bad dreams and give a much more pleasant and restorative night's sleep. So there's now little argument that finding things funny and enjoying a good laugh is extremely beneficial to us all. What we need to consider now are the ways in which laughter can be used as a treatment for people who... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the separate answer sheet. Published and copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2005.